Thank you. Thank you. I'm from Indianapolis. I guess you know that. And as I said this afternoon, I never did find out where the border between Indiana and Michigan was. It just never mattered. I'm happy to receive such an honor when I'm among my own people, which you are. Is We are freshwater people. And And every time I swim in the ocean, I feel like I'm swimming in chicken soup. Uh, uh, I, some of you will want to know my advice to young writers. And uh, this is it. Don't use semicolons. <laughs> they stand for absolutely nothing. They are transvestite. Hermaphrodites. <laughs> they are just a way of showing off <laughs> to show that you have been to college. Now, you may be amazed at how po poised I am, how at, at home I am, uh, facing an audience of this size and, and the degree of sophistication. Well, the explanation is quite simple. Is when I was in college, I took a course in public speaking. <laughs> and I learned that the first rule in public speaking is never apologize. Now when I heard that, I realized there must be audiences all over the world that had never been apologized to. <laughs> and that perhaps they would find it refreshing. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm sick about the whole damn thing. <laughs> I don't know how I can ever make it up to you and just thank God my wife wasn't along for this fiasco. Now, about 9-11, as everybody's talking about 9-11, well, we are now trying to recover and get our courage back about something most of us saw on television. That's where we are now. Uh, the, New, the New York Post asked me for a comment on 9-11 uh, the next day, and uh, I just had this to say, that the most stirring symbol of man's humanity to man that I can think of is a fire truck. Uh, vengeance and hate, now they're both very bad emotions. Now I'm going to ask you for several favors before we're out of here. The first one is from now on, please call your TV set a tantrum. It will never shut up, can't shut up. <clears throat> and I say this as one whose daughter was once married to Geraldo Rivera. It's the truth. Word of honor. I wasn't that worth coming out for tonight, just in itself, <laughs> to see a man who, whose daughter was actually married to Geraldo Rivera. <laughs> Here I am in 3D. You can actually smell me if you get close enough. There was no baby. If there had been, it would surely have been like a TV set, it never would have shut up. Now, great literature, Moby Dick, Huckleberry Finn, A Farewell to Arms, The Scarlet Letter, The Red Badge of Courage, they're all about how stinky it is to be a human being. Do you realize that that's what all great literature is about? And it's so relief, such a relief to have somebody say so. Now, <clears throat> I think we're perfectly awful animals, and I would much rather be a, a giraffe or a seagull. Now, evolution can go to hell as far as I'm concerned, because, <laughs> because what a mistake we are. We have mortally wounded this sweet life-supporting planet, the only one in the whole Milky Way, 
with a century of transportation whoopee. Uh, our government is conducting a campaign against drugs, is it? All right, then let them go after petroleum. <laughs> Talk. <laughs> Talk about a destructive high. You can put some of the stuff in your car and you can go 100 miles an hour and run over the neighbor's dog and tear the atmosphere to smithereens. Uh, as long as we're stuck with being homo sapiens, why mess around? Let's wreck the whole joint. Anybody got an atomic bomb? Who doesn't have an atomic bomb nowadays? Now, <clears throat> If you want to really hurt your parents, and you don't have the nerve to be a homosexual, <laughs> the least you can do is go into the arts. <laughs> now the joke in that is that so many people think that practicing art and art is a way to make a living, is a good way to make a living. Practicing an art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, for heaven's sakes. Now, I mean, I'm talking about singing in the shower, I'm talking about dancing to the radio, I'm talking about writing a poem to a friend, a lousy poem. That, and this is what I hate about the computer. Computer says, hey, I'm going to do all the, all the becoming now. You become by practicing an art, no matter how well or badly. And it's not a way to make a living. And, of course, the art courses are being cut out of, of uh, public schools all over the place because it's not a real trade. Well, it isn't a trade. It's a way to make your soul grow. You get an enormous reward. Uh, I, you students here, if got enough assignments already. But I've got one more for you. What I want you to do, first hold up your hands if you'll do anything I tell you to do. <laughs> All right, tonight, write a six line poem, rhymed, no fair, tennis without a net. Make it as good as you possibly can for you. Don't tell anybody what you're doing. All right. As soon as you have the poem, six lines, as good as you can make them, you, good for you, don't memorize it. Don't show it to anybody. Don't tell anybody you wrote it. Tear it up. Scatter the pieces in widely separated trash receptacles <laughs> and you will find out you have been rewarded big time. This came out of you. This is the act of creativity, the hell with fame, the hell with money. You created this. So please do that tonight. Now, sappy woman sent me a letter a few years back, she knew I was sappy too, <laughs> which is to say a lifelong Northern Democrat in the Franklin Roosevelt tradition. She was about to have a baby, not mine, <laughs> and she wanted to know if it was a bad thing to bring such an innocent animal into a world that's terrible. And I replied to her that what made being alive almost worthwhile for me was the saints I met, who could be anywhere. By saints, I mean people who behave decently in a strikingly indecent society. Perhaps some, some of you can be, become a saint for her child to me. Now you and the local police department are entitled to know, since I'm going to spend the night among you tonight, that I am both a humanist and a Luddite. Now, I just might hold a black mass 
in the motel parking lot at midnight tonight. My parents and grandparents were also humanists, what used to be called free thinkers. So I am honoring my ancestors, which the Bible says is a good thing to do. Now, a humanist adores, customarily adores Jesus Christ. And, and what a humanist will say about Jesus is, if what he said was good, what does it matter whether he was God or not? And my Lord, he said so many good things. Now, we humanists try to be behave as decently and fairly as honorably as we can without any expectation of rewards or punishments in an afterlife. Uh, we serve as best we can. Uh, the only abstraction with which we have any real famili familiarity, which is our community. Now, I am honorary president of the American Humanist Association. I succeeded the late great science fiction writer Isaac Asimov in that totally functionless capacity. <laughs> and we had a memorial service for uh, Isaac uh, several years ago, and uh, I spoke, and at one point I said, Isaac is up in heaven now. This was the funniest thing I could have said to an audience of humanists. <laughs> He rolled him in the eyes. It was several <laughs> several minutes before order could be restored. Now, I think that's my favorite joke of all. And I hope that some of you will do me the favor of when, God forbid, I should die, you will say, Kurt's up in heaven now. <laughs> Now, I explained humanism to you. I said I was a humanist and a Luddite. What is a Luddite? Oh, incidentally, I hope you all know what a twerp is, do you? <laughs> a twerp is a guy who <coughs> stuffs a set of false teeth up his butt rear end <laughs> and bites the buttons off the back seats of taxi cabs. <laughs> <laughs> or at least at least that's what a twerp was when I went to high school <laughs> never mind what a snarf is <laughs> now a Luddite by contrast <laughs> is a hater of newfangled contraptions Ned Ludd was a textile worker in England around the start of the 19th century, and he supposedly busted up a lot of new machinery, which was going to put him out of work, which was going to make it impossible for him, with his particular skills, uh, to feed and clothe and shelter his family. Uh, a Forbes magazine asked a bunch of us not long ago, I think two years ago now, to name our favorite modern uh, technologies. And I said my address book and the Encyclopedia Britannica because they were both alphabetical. <laughs> and uh, I also liked the blue mailbox on the corner, which when I fed it manuscripts, uh, it looked like a big blue bullfrog. I'd feed it a manuscript and it'd go, ribbit. <laughs> but anyway, the... Anyway, Britannica sent me a whole set. <laughs> it's because I said this, and uh, I gave it to a grandniece who was flunking out of nursery school. <laughs> <laughs> now, progress has beat the heck out of me. It took away from me what a loom must have been for Ned Ludd. 200 years ago, I mean a typewriter. There is no longer such a thing anywhere. Huckleberry Finn, incidentally, was the first novel ever to be typewritten. And did I tell you what a twerp is? Yes, I think I did. <laughs> Listen, 
In the old days, and not long ago either, in New York we had a four-story house. My wife, the photojournalist Joe Cremens, uh, who is very high tech and is even higher tech now, was it worked on the first floor, I worked on the top floor. And I typed. And then after I had about 20 pages, as I would mark it up with a pen, making corrections and everything. And then I would carry, call Carrie Atkins, Carol Atkins, who, can you imagine, was a typist. And she was out in Woodstock, New York. I first knew her in New York, and she moved out to Woodstock. And, you know, that's where the famous uh, sex and drugs uh, event was uh, in, in the 60s. And anybody who says he remembers being there wasn't there. <laughs> anyway, so I call up Carol. I say, hey, Carol, how you going? And uh, how's your back? And uh, we chat back and forth. I love to talk to people. And uh, her, she and her husband have been trying to attract bluebirds. And any of you who have tried to attract bluebirds, you put the house only three feet off the ground, usually along a power line. Why there are any bluebirds left is that close to the ground, I don't know. But they haven't had any luck, and neither have I. I've got a place out in the country. But anyway, we chat away. And uh, finally I say, uh, hey, you know, I got some pages. You want to type them up for me? Because, shoot, it'll be so neat. It'll look as done like a computer when she gets through with it. And uh, she said, oh, swell. Yes, sure, I'm still doing it. And uh, I said, well, I hope it doesn't get lost in the mail. And, and she said, nothing ever gets lost in the mail. That, in fact, is my experience. I've never lost anything. And so... Anyway, she's in dead blood now. Is is her, you know, uh, her typing is worthless. Uh, but anyway, anyway, I take my pages, and I have this uh, thing made out of steel. It's sort of an elongated O. Uh, it's called a paper clip, and <laughs> put my pages together, being careful to number them too, of course. And then I'm going downstairs, it's two floors, and then finally I pass my wife's high-tech office, and she says, where are you going? Her favorite reading when she was a girl was Nancy Drew, um, mysteries, you know, as girl detective. So she says, where are you going? <laughs> I say, I'm going out to get an envelope. She said, well, you're not a poor man. Why don't you get 50 envelopes and put them in a closet and get 100? I say, hush. And I, <laughs> and I go outside, and I go. This is on 48th Street in New York City, right off between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. And I go to a news store there where they also sell stationery. And I go in there, and people buy lottery tickets there. That's usually a line of people uh, wanting lottery tickets. But anyway, I know their stock very well. And so I get an envelope, a manila envelope, and uh, for my, it's as though that whoever made that envelope knew what size paper I was using. <laughs> anyway, I get in line and wait my turn to pay and, and everything and, and there are other people there buying lottery tickets and cigarettes and whatever and you know I chat with them I say you know do you know anybody who ever won anything in a lottery and what happened to your foot and <laughs> and so forth and it's finally interesting and, and I will finally get up to the head of the line there and the people who own this store are Hindus. And she has a jewel between her eyes. Now, isn't that worth a trip? <laughs> and anyway, I pay for the envelope. And then I take my manuscript and put it inside. And uh, uh, it has two little prongs, metal prongs, uh, for going through a hole in the flap. Uh, there are two ways of closing this envelope. 
and I use both of them. And anyway, is I first I, I I lick the mucilage. It's kind of sexy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I glue the flap down and then spread the little metal fin diddlies I never did know what they're called and I go to the postal convenience center which is just half a block away now this is very close to the United Nations and so there are all these funny looking people there <laughs> from all over the world and uh, so I go in there, and they're lined up again, and uh, I will, I'm secretly in love with the woman behind the counter. She doesn't know it. My wife knows it. And I'm not about to do anything about it. And anyway, but she is so nice. And she, all I've ever seen of her is, is from, you know, is, is just from here on in, because she's always behind the counter. Uh, that every day she'll do something with herself from here on up to cheer us up. Sometimes her hair will be all frizzy. Sometimes she will have ironed it flat. Is One day she was wearing black lipstick. But this is all so exciting and generous of her just to cheer us all up, people from all over the world. Yeah. And so... Anyway, I wait in line, and again, you know, is, is say, hey, what was that language you were talking? Was that Urdu? And, you know, it's, it's learn. I have a degree in anthropology, so I'm, I'm used to talking to people not, like, not at all like me. Uh, anyway, I have nice chats with them, and, and you know, it's also, uh, if you don't like it here, why don't you go back to your tinhorn little dictatorship where you came from <laughs> so finally I get up to the head of the line and I do not reveal to her that I love her she, she might as well be looking at a cantaloupe it is so little information in my face that my heart is beating and I give her the envelope and she mails it I mean she she weighs it because I want to put the right number of stamps on that and have her okay it you know if I say that's a, if she says it's the right number of stamps and cancels it that's it they can't send it back to me anyway I finally get the right stamps and everything then I go outside there's a mailbox out there blue and I feed the pages to the blue bullfrog on the corner and it said a ribbit <laughs> and I go home and I have had one hell of a good time <laughs> and we are here on earth to fart around and don't let anybody tell you any different <laughs> okay, now let's have some fun. Let's talk about sex. <laughs> let's talk about women. Now, <clears throat> Freud said he didn't know what women wanted. Well, I know what they want. They want a whole lot of people to talk to. What do they, what do they want to talk about? They want to talk about everything. Uh, what do men want? Well, they want a lot of pals. And they wish people wouldn't get so mad at them. Now, why are so many people getting divorced today? It's because most of us don't have extended families anymore. It used to be that when a man and a woman got married, the bride got a lot more people to talk to about everything. The groom got a lot more pals to tell his dumb jokes to. <laughs> now, you know, as it used to be when, when all our, before all our extended families got broken up by 
migration, by industrial revolution or whatever. You know, I say about my wife, you know, I like Jenny and everything. I have more goddamn fun with her, Uncle Charlie. <laughs> now, a few Americans, but not very many, have extended families anymore. The Navajos, the Kennedys. <laughs> but most of us, we get married nowadays are just one person for the other person. The groom gets one more pal, but it's a woman. The woman gets one more person to talk to about everything, but it's a man. Now, when a couple is in an argument nowadays, they may think it's about sex or about money or about how to raise the kids. It's not. What each one of them is saying to the other one is, you're not enough people. <laughs> True, not a joke. Now, see what the hell else I got here. I don't know. <laughs> when did I start? I don't even know. <laughs> All right. Uh, God bless you and those who made it possible for you to study at this institution of higher learning. By becoming informed and reasonable and capable adults, you are making this a better world than it was before you got here. Now, have we ever met before? No. Uh, but I have thought a lot about people like you. You men are Adam, you women are Eve. Who hasn't thought a lot about Adam and Eve? Now, this is Eden. Sooner or later, you're all going to have to leave because you will have eaten the knowledge apple. Now, who am I? Well, I used to be Adam, but now I'm Methuselah. <laughs> so what does this Methuselah have to say to you since he has lived so long? Damn near 80 years. I'll pass on to you what another Methuselah said to me. He's Joe Heller, the late Joe Heller now. He is, of course author of Catch-22. How many of you read Catch-22? Yeah. Uh, one young person said to me, one time he wasn't so young anymore, he said when he was young, the three books that had influenced him most all had cat in them. It was Catch-22, Catch Cradle, what was the other one? Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting, don't you? Know? Anyway, uh, Joe Heller and I had houses together out on Long Island, and uh, we had, there are billionaires out there who collect all sorts of people at their parties, you know, as football players, authors, singers, everything, just as long as they're fairly well known. And I said to Heller, I said, Joe, how does it make you feel to know that our host yesterday probably made more money than Catch-22, one of the most popular novels of all time, earned in its entire publishing history worldwide. And Joe Heller thought a minute, and then he said, I've got something he can never have. Anybody want to guess what it is? The knowledge that I have enough. So I recommend that to you. Uh, his example may be of comfort to many of you, Adams and Eves, who in later years will have to admit that something has gone terribly wrong and that despite the education you received here, you have somehow failed to become billionaires. Now, well-dressed people ask me sometimes with their teeth bared as though they were about to bite me if I believe in a redistribution of wealth, I can only reply that it doesn't matter what I think, that wealth is already being redistributed every hour, often in ways which are absolutely fantastic. Nobel Prizes are peanuts compared with what a linebacker for the Detroit Lions makes in a single year nowadays. 
for about a hundred years, and the most lucrative prize for a person who has made a really meaningful contribution to the culture of the world as a physicist, a chemist, a physiologist, a physician, a writer, or, God bless him or her, a maker of peace, that has been the Nobel Prize. It has been, a, it's about worth a million dollars now. Those dollars come, incidentally, from a fortune made by a Swede who mixed clay with nitroglycerin and gave us dynamite. Kaboom. Alfred Nobel intended that his prizes make the <clears throat> planet's most valuable inhabitants independently wealthy so that they could be uninhibited um, uh, as they went about doing whatever they did and would not have to pay any attention to wealthy patrons or governments. But one million dollars now is only a white chip in a world of sports and entertainment on Wall Street many lawsuits as compensation for executives of our larger corporations. One million dollars in the tabloids <clears throat> and on the evening news is chump change. Now, I'm reminded of a movie in W.C. Fields uh, in which he is watching a poker game in a saloon in a gold rush town. And uh, Fields announces his presence by putting a $100 bill on the table. And the players barely look up. And finally one of them says, <clears throat> give him a white chip. <laughs> but the cost of a college education, a minor fraction of a million dollars, is anything but chump change to most Americans. Have academic degrees in the past been passports to international glory, to wealth, grotesquely out of scale with the needs of ordinary families in a few cases maybe Albin maybe can name a handful of celebrities who have come from here but most graduates from here are from Harvard or Oxford or the Sorbonne or any place else you care to name have been of use locally rather than nationally and they have commonly been rewarded with modest but adequate amounts of money and even less fame in place of fame they may have had to be content with someone seemingly heartfelt thanks for something from time to time. In time, this will prove to have been the destiny of most, if but not of all, of you Adams and Eves in this nice audience. They will find themselves <clears throat> building or strengthening their communities. Please love at such a destiny. Let it if it turns out to be yours. For communities are all that is substantial about what we create or defend or maintain in this world. All the rest is hoopla. For your footloose generation, that community could be easily New York City or Washington, D.C. or Paris or Chicago or Detroit or Adelaide, Australia or Shanghai or Kuala Lumpur. Mark Twain, at the end of a profoundly meaningful life, for which he never received a Nobel Prize, asked himself what it was we all live for. He came up with six words which satisfied him. They satisfy me. They should satisfy you. The good opinion of our neighbors. Neighbors are people who know you, can see you, can talk to you, to whom you may have been of some help or beneficial stimulation, they are not nearly as numerous as the fans say of Madonna or Michael Jordan. They earn their, to earn their good opinions, you should apply the special skills you have learned here and meet the standards of decency and honor and fair play set by exemplary books and elders. One of you twerps might actually get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> could happen now this speech is almost twice as long as the most efficient oration in the history of the world Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address up to this point it's been stuffed for this occasion uh, but 
every address I've given has ended, and this one will too, with old stuff about my Uncle Alex, my father's kid brother, a Harvard graduate who nonetheless wound up as an insurance salesman in Indianapolis. He was also wise. One thing with Uncle, which Uncle Alex found objectionable about human beings was that they so seldom took time to notice it when they were happy. He himself did this <coughs> best. He, did, he himself did his best to acknowledge it when times were sweet. We could be drinking lemonade in the shade of an apple tree the summer afternoon, and he would interrupt the conversation to say, if this isn't nice, what is? So, I hope that you, Adams and Eves, before me, will do the same for the rest of your lives. When things are going sweetly and peacefully, please pause a moment and then say out loud, if this isn't light, nice, what is? Now, there's another favor I ask of you. Don't forget your poetry assignment. Uh, I ask everyone here, regardless of age, uh, including the president, for heaven's sakes, uh, I'd like a show of hands after I ask this question. How many of you have had a teacher at any level of your education who made you more excited, made you feel more alive, prouder to be alive, than you had previously believed possible. Hold up your hands. All right. Now take down your hands and say the name of that teacher to a person sitting next to you. If this isn't nice, what is? <laughs> All right. Uh, I, <clears throat> my education is technical, maybe you know that. Uh, I've never made a systematic study of literature because I was supposed to become a, per a, a chemist like my brother. My brother Bernie incidentally discovered a silver iodide will make it snow and rain sometimes. Uh, but anyway, I have nonetheless whenever I've been on a faculty, I've, I've been in the English department and uh, I've tried to bring uh, scientific thinking to literature. And I, there hasn't been a great deal of gratitude for this, I must say. <laughs> but stories, stories have very beautiful mathematical shapes, the most popular stories do. If some of you can't see that, who cares? <laughs> All right, this is the GI axis. Good fortune, ill fortune. Death down here, very good health up here. Extremely rich, dead broke down here. Average state of affairs here. This I call the B-E axis. To the shape of a story. B stands for beginning, E stands for entropy. <laughs> All right, now let me give you a marketing tip. The people who can afford to buy fiction, go to movies and so forth, don't like to hear about people who are poor and sick. Start your story up here. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to show you a story you have seen over and over and over. And if you'd stayed home instead of coming to see a man whose daughter was married to Geraldo Rivera, <laughs> you would see this story over and over again. And there's no reason to copyright it. It's the most popular story. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. <laughs> now, 
I haven't. I haven't. I haven't uh, used drawing instruments here, but it's not accidental that the far end is higher than where we began. It's exciting. It's encouraging to the readers. It's, you know, by God, I read that story. That's what it is to be a human being. And and if I got into trouble, I'd have that much in reserve too. You know. And uh, another story that's very popular. Uh, it, this is called Man in a Hole, but it needn't be about a man in a hole. It, <laughs> and there's another one uh, it's called Boy Meets Girl, but it needn't be about a boy meeting a girl. Somebody on a day like any other day comes across something absolutely wonderful. Oh boy, this is my lucky day. Shit. <laughs> he gets it back again. Now one of the most popular stories ever told violates all my rules. Starts down here. Oh wait, here's another story. Well, it certainly violates. Uh, there's a Franz Kafka story uh, about uh, your ancestors are from Czechoslovakia, incidentally, and so was Kafka. Uh, anyway, this rather ordinary, unattractive young man uh, has a lousy job with no chance of promotion because he himself is so uninteresting and, and his relatives are disagreeable. He doesn't have enough money to go have a beer or take a girl dancing. So, it's time to go to work again. And he has turned into a cockroach. <laughs> it's a very pessimistic story. <laughs> But anyway, this popular story violates my rules. There's this young girl whose mother has died. Her father gets married almost immediately to just a dreadful battle axe with two mean daughters. <laughs> You've heard it. <laughs> All right. So. All right, there she is. That's why she's so low. And so there's going to be a party at the palace. They tell her she can't go, but she's got to get the women all dressed up to go to the palace. Now, does she become even more unhappy? No. This stout-hearted little girl, the death of her mother is maximum grief. So she helps them go and everything, and she's left all alone. The fairy godmother comes. And... Uh, gives her mascara, pantyhose. Yeah. <laughs> Everything you need to go to a party and have a swell time and a means of transportation and so forth. And all right, so she is, winds up at the party, all dressed up. She is so heavily made up, her relatives don't recognize her. <laughs> the prince falls in love with her. Oh, boy, as, as promised by the fairy godmother, when the clock strikes 12, she loses it all. She has to go home again. All right, so we drop down, because it doesn't take long in real time for even a slow clock to strike 12. <laughs> uh, do we drop down to the same level? No, for the rest of her life. No matter what happens next, she'll remember when she was the belle of the ball. All right. So she poops along at this considerably improved level uh, until the shoe fits and she becomes off-scale happy. <laughs> now, there's another... 
Perhaps this is a joke. I hope not. Uh, perhaps a real, this maybe pop fiction is, is the most simple-minded fiction that can be crucified on a cross of this design. And perhaps a true masterpiece couldn't possibly be. Uh, well, what about Hamlet? Not a bad piece of work. So, so, and we don't have to draw a new line here. Same situation. Young person, sex is different. But Hamlet's father has died. And his mother has gotten, is married right away, married his uncle, as a matter of fact. So Hamlet is grief-stricken there. Is, and uh, so his... Hamlet is mourning and, and hating his mother, really, for, for getting married so soon. And his friend comes down and says, Hey, Hamlet, there's this thing up on the parapet. I think better, you better talk to it. <laughs> it claims it's your father. <laughs> so Hamlet goes up there. Uh, is that good news or bad news? We don't know. So we just keep going on that level. And uh, so Hamlet goes up and talks to this thing. And this thing, we don't know for sure it was Hamlet's father. There are evil spirits floating around all the time. Don't mess with a Ouija board because anything can show up. <laughs> Perhaps this ghost claiming to be his father and saying I was murdered and here's how I was murdered and you got to avenge me. We don't know whether that was good news or bad news. So Hamlet says, all right, well, he says, I'll, I'll check out the ghost story. Uh, I'll hire some actors. And they'll act out the way the murder was supposedly committed, you know, poison in his father's ear. And I'll have my father, my new, my stepfather, watch the murder, the murder suspect anyway. And so he holds this play. Does, a, does his uncle say, you know, like in a Perry Mason show, is, I can't stand it, yes, I did it, I did it, I did it. <laughs> no, nothing happened. Neither good nor bad news. <clears throat> so, Hamlet is up seeing his mother and, and the draperies move up there where he's talking. And he said, by God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of being indecisive and everything. He pulls out his rapier, he thinks it's his uncle back there, the drapes, and he stabs through the drapes. And who falls out? That's Polonius, this fat windbag. <laughs> it's Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> well, is this good news or bad news? Well, it, Shakespeare himself regarded this man as a clown, as a fool. And what parents take seriously is as though it was Shakespeare's advice on what to say to your kid when the kid leaves, you know, home for the first time. And it's useless advice. He's neither a borrower nor a lender be. Thanks a lot, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> this above all to thine own self be true. Oh, thanks, Dad. Yes, that, that, that's easily done, and so forth. And so, it's neither good news or bad news that Hamlet's not going to get arrested because he's a prince. He can kill anybody he wants. So it's neither <coughs> good news or bad news. And we poop along at this same level. Finally, he gets in the duel. And he's mortally wounded. I, did he go to heaven? That would certainly be very good news. He'd be off scale happy, or he could go where Kafka's cockroach went and uh, be off scale unhappy. I don't think in any of his plays, Shakespeare indicates that he believes any more than I do in a heaven or hell. Anyway, so. <laughs> and I'll tell you, why we would recognize Hamlet as a masterpiece. This, I mean, well, the language is really something, of course. But 
he says what he's saying is in this play we really don't know what the good news is and what the good bad news is if you think about it, you know when we're young we're taught to respond to other people's ideas of what's good news and what's bad news and so you know this if a four-year-old kid maybe three years old his parents are so excited my god they can't wait to tell the kid and everything oh it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened and uh, <laughs> it's your birthday what could be a more empty piece of information <laughs> yeah, so the kids go ha, 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 ha. <laughs> please the parents and you know when we go through life this way is you know our team won ha, 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 ha. <laughs> our candidate won ha, ha. and we're just pretending because we really don't know and although I don't believe in an afterlife I wish there were a heaven so I could go up there and ask somebody hey what was the good news and what was the bad news <laughs> and thank you for your attention <laughs>